diagnosis of breast cancer can cause a life-changing ripple effect of impact, affecting those we love the most and those upon whom we lean for comfort and strength in the most challenging of times. My name is Ashling Hurley and I'm the CEO of Breast Cancer Ireland and you're listening to More Than A Lump, a podcast that talks openly and honestly to a selection of guests about their very personal connections to breast cancer, be it through their career choice, their own first-hand experience of the disease or through sharing the experience of close family members. My conversations will centre on how breast cancer has informed their perspective on life, love, family, health, their goals and aspirations. Although each story is utterly unique, the one common thread that runs through each one is that breast cancer is more than a lump. This episode of More Than A Lump is proudly supported by CarePlus Pharmacy. CarePlus is Ireland's leading community pharmacy brand offering expert advice and services for a healthier and happier you. Find your nearest CarePlus on careplus.ie or follow them on social media for daily health and wellness tips. Sorka Lavelle was just 22 years of age when following a routine visit to her GP to get a prescription for the pill, she was diagnosed with an aggressive breast cancer that had spread to her lymph nodes. She admits she wasn't breast aware and thought the small lump on her left breast, which was about the size of a pea, was almost not worthy of a mention. Fortunately for Sorka, she did bring it to the doctor's attention, who sent her on for a referral to St. James's Hospital. Sirka joins me today to share her story and to remind us all that breast cancer is not just a disease that affects older women. She's passionate about telling young women in particular to look out for the signs and symptoms. Sirka, thank you so much for joining me here today and for taking the time to drive to Dublin from Cavan to share your important messages with our More Than A Lump listeners. You were only 22, the same age as my own daughter, when you felt that lump. Tell us what happened. So I had gone to my GP. Well, it was basically, I had found this lump the size of a pea, like you said. I went to my GP, thought nothing of it, didn't really think anything. Um, Obviously, for every six months, you have to get your blood pressure taken so you can get your pills. So I went in and I had just said to her, look, listen, while I'm here, can you have a look at this? Um, And I had gone to this GP for years. So she was like, yeah, no problem. So she looked at it and she's like, just a precaution, I'm going to send you because anybody who presents themselves with a lump in their breast will have to go to a breast clinic. And she asked me which one was the most local to me. So I picked James. Um, and she said I'll send it off as like a non-urgent because they can do urgent or non-urgent in a case where they see fit and obviously with me being 22 they really didn't think anything of it which is fair enough Mm -hmm. so I went off um, and I went about my business and that would have been in the April and then it would have been about the start of August, end of July, that I would have had my appointment in James's. I took a half day off work. Um, I went in and my mom came with me. And before you go, they send you like a form of what's going to happen and what you do. Mm-hmm. So they said like, you'll see a consultant, you'll get a mammogram, you'll get an MRI and so on. So we went and we waited and we waited and we waited. And it was like, you were waiting for hours. You felt, it felt like hours, but it probably maybe was like two hours. Um, went in and saw a registrar. And she looked me over and at the time it had been from seeing my GP to going in here, it had grown from the size of a pea to about the size of a golf ball. So it had oh, wow. massively grown. And I still yeah. naively was like, oh, it's nothing. Like there's nothing, there's nothing there. Didn't think anything of it. My mm-hmm. mom had suffered with cysts before. So I genuinely thought that this was just going to be something benign and nothing to worry about. Mm-hmm. And my friends and I had spoken about it whilst I was waiting and nothing really between my friends and I came up that it would be anything. And we were like a group of three girls and none of us would have said anything different. Um, and, and how were you in. feeling in yourself at that time? I was sick. I was probably like, I was getting like chest infections. I was like vomiting. Like, and I like, I, I used to go out drinking. Like I worked Monday to Friday. I was working a full time mm-hmm. job. I'd left my old job because I was wasn't feeling too well so I left that um and I was picking up like sickness it's like no tomorrow but I just thought like you know it's just typical like I'm maybe young, yeah like I'm not like looking yeah. after myself so I should be I'm not taking my vitamins like I yeah. didn't really think anything yeah. of it but I remember towards the end I used to get darting pains through my chest that, that would run up in through my breast um and that was about maybe like a month before going to this appointment and I just thought oh I'm going to the appointment so I'll just say it there like it's mm-hmm. why would I bother going back to my GP when I already have this appointment and mm-hmm. um, again that was obviously a naive thing to think as well and um, so I went to the appointment waited went in and the registrar looked at me and she did the whole thing and she's like okay we'll come back in eight weeks and my mom was with me and my mom was a nurse so she was like no she's like my daughter's 22 and she's coming to you with a lump that has grown and now she's also getting darting pains through her breast like I want her to be seen to today and on this form it says that like this will happen and she was like oh no that's only in like exceptional circumstances and like this isn't we don't see this as an exceptional circumstance so my mom was like I want to see the consultant who's on today and as the reg was walking out the room I'll never forget this she was like I'm 99% sure that this isn't breast cancer 
Wow. And the consultant came in, he checked me over and he said, I want you back tomorrow for a mammogram and I want you to an MRI. Yeah. And that was it. And that's kind of where I started. So then I went back to work, didn't think anything of it again. I was still like, oh, it's fine. So I, I went back to work that day, came in the next day, took another half day from work, did my mammogram. Horrific as well. <laughs> <laughs> it is so painful. But, you know, it is like if anyone can do it like and that's another thing like mammograms, the like the, the age limit for a mammogram. I know it's what is I it? Thirty five. Oh, no, well, it's, no, from 50. Yeah. From 50. Oh, if, for the free breast check. For the free check. breast check. Yeah, yeah. So, like, that's another thing that I always think, like, why are we doing it for, for the older generation? Mm. Like, why is that not, like, even 30? I suppose the issue is that for younger people, and it's something we constantly say to people, is that from the age of 50, the reason why they, uh, they adopt 50 as the age category is as you get older, your breast tissue turns from white into grey, mm -hmm. into dark grey, into black. Mm -hmm. So when you're in your 80s and 90s, it's black. But as mm -hmm. you get older, the breast tissue dies off and it becomes um, grey. Yeah. So the younger you are, your breast tissue is white. Cancer is white. So mm -hmm. cancer is white on white. Very hard to detect okay. in a mammogram. Mm. But yet mammography is the standard and the best um, imaging we have yeah. available. It is really, 90% is accurate. Mm -hmm. So in younger people like you, yeah. they would absolutely say, we'll do mammogram yeah. and we will then very much do ultrasound, do yeah. an MRI yeah. to see wh where we go from here. Yeah, so I would have done an ultrasound then as well. That day I had an ultrasound done as well. Um, and then they took a biopsy. Okay. So I'd have had the biopsy done. But again, I was like, oh, it's fine. Two yeah. weeks went past, 17th of August. I went back out with my mom and my mom got the bus up um, from Kells because we would have been living in Cavan at the time. That's where I grew up for part of my life. So my mom was living there with my stepdad. And I remember she got the bus from Kells and like every day we passed it, like if we ever passed it together, she'd be like, I'll never forget the day that I got the bus from there. Mm -hmm. I took another half day off work thinking genuinely, this is how much I didn't think of it. Like I just took a half day off work. I I worked in town at the time and my mom met me in town and we both got the Lewis out to James's hospital together and I waited and it's funny because the more I think back on it now everybody who had been called in prior to me was called in by the consultant but when it came to me I was called in by the breast nurse and that's I clocked that after I was like that's because somebody has to be in the room when you get diagnosed. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't have known that prior, but it was only after not, I yeah. thought about it. I was like, because everybody else was called in by him except for me. Mm -hmm. It was the breast nurse who I'm still very friendly with now and has been very, very good to me throughout my whole journey. Lovely, mm -hmm. lovely woman in James's. Um, so she brought me in and they do this whole small talk, like, oh, you're 22, you work here and this is where you live. And he just turned to me and he said, I'm really sorry, I'm diagnosing you with aggressive form of breast cancer. And I laughed and I said, you're joking. And he goes, I'm not. And I remember I just was like, what? I remember looking at my mom and my mom's eyes were full of tears. And I was just like, what? I like, I just couldn't comprehend it. Like, and then he said a few more things, but like, I don't remember anything. I remember though, leaving there and going into the toilet <clears throat> in James's and like literally like leaning myself against the door and just like falling down crying. Cause I was like, <laughs> what is going on like yeah. like yesterday I was a normal 22 year old living in Dublin working in Dublin going out with my friends and now today it's like everything is different um so did they did they tell you there and then the type of treatment plan you might be going on no or? so they kind of drip feed you the information to okay. make it easier to absorb so they would have given me that information the 17th and I'm sure I maybe had the day off after that and then I would have been back up in the hospital meeting my consultant again and then they would have given us the the process of how I'll go through my treatment plan mm -hmm. um, I remember going home that night and I went back to my house in Dublin with my mom packed up whatever I thought I needed and went and my mom drove us down to Cavan and I lived in Cavan from then on and um, I remember my mom had to like ring my brother like I'd be very close to my brother who now lives in in Cavan beside us I remember my mom had to ring him and he came down and then I had a brother who lived in Toronto and I had a brother who lived in London as well so my mom had to ring everybody oh. and like it's just heartbreaking as well like and I think for my brothers who lived abroad I think that was really tough for them because they mm -hmm. couldn't be there mm -hmm. and I'm their baby sister like I'm the youngest yeah. I'm the I only girl I mean it's girl. unimaginable you know yeah. at 22 years of age that you'd have a sibling that's yeah. diagnosed yeah so then they told me, so that was a couple of days later. I can't remember the, the exact date, but they would have told me then a couple of days later. So you'll have chemotherapy and then we'll do surgery and then we'll do radiotherapy. So then two weeks later, I started my chemotherapy. So on like the 30th of mm. August, I was on my first round of chemotherapy. Wow. Um, and I had chemotherapy every week, every Wednesday. 
um, for a couple of weeks. I think it was about 12 weeks. And I remember like for the first couple of weeks or the first two weeks, you were you were fine. Like it's until it builds up in your system. And then it was, um, I remember like I'd get chemo on a Wednesday and by like the Saturday, I'd be feeling like somewhat okay. Sunday, you're okay. And then Monday, Tuesday, you're like, oh, I'm fine. And then I'll come back again to Wednesday so quickly. And then you're back again. And then that faded because then I got onto another round of chemo. So I was on two sets of chemo. Okay. Um, and then I did her septin as well. So I started that as well. Um, but yeah, I remember when it was coming down to like, I think I had done my second round of chemo. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to do my hair because I had asked, I'd asked all these yeah. questions. I was like to my oncologist and he was like a man of my dad's age and he had yeah. kids my age. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was a lovely, lovely man. He's recently retired, but lovely man brought me through my whole journey. I got, I was very fond of him. Um, and I asked him like will I lose my hair and he goes yeah you'll lose everything like everything you're just going to lose your eyelashes your eyebrows he never beat her in the bush yeah, brilliant. he was so, so so straight to the point with me and it was great because I needed that yeah. didn't need someone to modi coddle me mm-hmm. I just needed the information and yeah. then like I could deal with it myself mm-hmm. um but and I, for anyone that because we, we can't see you because we're on a podcast yeah but you have amazingly beautiful yeah. hair <laughs> yeah it's because it would have been a lot lighter I'm like quite ginger naturally so it would have okay. been a lot lighter to this as well and I would have had this thickness and curly yeah. ginger hair and yeah, yeah I remember thinking like this is the only thing I have control over I so know. let me deal with this how yeah. I want to so I went to a wig shop in town with my friend my mom dropped me in and I was like I told her my story and I was like it's, you know I'm just gonna get my hair cut and she's like okay we'll kind of do like a bob first and and I sat there in the in the mirror and I was like, nah, let's just let's just cut it all off. And she's like, no, no, I think we should start. And I was like, no, 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 I got it. Like, I, let's just shave it all off. So shaved my wow, whole hair in, off in, in one in one, one go. go. I went from this. It probably would have been about the length of this to it being totally bald in one day. So shaved it all off. And um, yeah, that's kind of. And then I got a wig, and I didn't really wear the wig much. I wore a lot of headscarves. That was kind of my thing. Yeah. I wore a lot of headscarves. Yeah. A lot of times, people often say that the wigs. Whether they're too warm or they're, they're itchy. So and, itchy yeah. and so <laughs> hot. And you're just like, why am I bothered? People yeah. know I have cancer. I have I no know. eyebrows or eyelashes. Yeah. It's like, yeah. who am I trying to kid here? So yeah, yeah I um, I opted for the headscarf. That was my thing. And then your treatment, you had a, a mastectomy of the left breast. Yeah, so after chemo. So chemo would have ran until about... I think it would have ran in through Christmas as well. And then I think I got about a couple of weeks off in January. And then I had my first mastectomy on in the February. So I did a um, reconstruction on the day. So I was in theatre for about nine hours. Um, And I remember coming out of it and I was like, oh, my God, the pain. The pain is undescribable. Um, And then it was two nights later, I got an infection in my implant. So I had to go back. I had to be rushed back into surgery on antibiotics, rushed back to surgery, implant removed, washed and put back in. I was in hospital for about three and a half four weeks that time it was tough it was very 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 tough yeah and the decision to have it immediately Mm -hmm. was yours or was it recommended to you it was recommended but I also think it was probably they saw me as a 22 year old and I had just gone 23 I'm a December baby so Mm -hmm. I had just turned the 23 and I had gone through I was like going through chemo during my 23rd birthday which is crazy to think like so I yeah I'd gone through it and so I think it was maybe a joint decision but I do think it was a lot to my plastic surgeon consultant who was a female um, and my oncologist and my consultant and would have probably seen me as kids their own age and yeah. thought this is a lot for someone to deal with mentally mm-hmm. let alone mm-hmm. then the physical aspect of it as well so mm-hmm. we did reconstruction on the day which was wow. great and I had um, an expander implant so would have put in would have been put in smaller and then you expand it with with water so I would have had it expanded every week or so up in Dublin up in um, the plastics team up in Dublin as well okay. so I would have okay. had to do that too okay. yeah so and then you went on then to have another uh, you're right so I did my I did my radiotherapy first so I did 28 days consecutively of radiotherapy mm-hmm. in Dublin as well mm-hmm. um and that was quite tough in itself as well because it it, it would have burnt like it burns your skin obviously because the radiotherapy so yeah. I did 28 full days of that and then I would have gone back and I had my second mastectomy on my right breast Without any difficulty? Without any difficulties. Okay. So I was in hospital probably for about a week maybe just because mm-hmm. it's such an intensive surgery yeah. and it's so harsh on your body. Like breast surgery in general is quite is quite a hard one. So I think that it's just, it's it's quite intrusive on your body. Um, But I recovered much quicker, much quicker 
on this one around because yeah. obviously it just wasn't but on my first one obviously they had taken out 28 lymph nodes on my breast that was obviously had the cancer in it they took out 28 lymph nodes and this was after chemotherapy and three of those lymph nodes were still active with cancer yeah, yeah. So, so it was, it was, had to happen. Yeah. Had to happen. Yeah. And had I left it, maybe say the eight weeks that the reg wanted me to leave, I don't know. Yes, exactly. Because it was, it was that aggressive. It was so mm. aggressive and it was spreading. So mm. it spread from my breast into my lymph nodes yeah. and it would have just continued. Continued through the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If I hadn't have been caught. Yeah. And tell me, so um, on the drugs that you've been on. Yeah. So, I mean, at 23 years of age, you are plunged yeah. into early menopause yeah so i would have gone on to zolidex which is a hormone um you inject it into you and it shuts off your ovaries yeah and then i was on um tamoxifen which i'm still on mm -hmm. it's another hormone uh, based drug so i was put into early menopause where i was getting hot flushes i didn't have a period i didn't have anything nothing um so that in itself was really hard to deal with because you're dealing with the side effects of coming off chemo and then I was still on Herceptin for a year mm. so you were coming off that and then you're still in the midst of dealing then with being in an early menopause and I took 16 months off for this whole thing and then I went back into work and I became I went back into being a flight attendant after 16 months Wow. Yeah, so I went straight back into work. I just had like, I was like, I don't want to like be doing nothing anymore. Because yeah. at that point you become, you're not sick anymore, let's say, mm. because you're not feeling the side effects of the chemo. So in, in my head, because I was so young, I was like, I'm better. So now I want to become my old self again. I want to get yeah. back into the world. I want to start mm. working. I want to start socializing. I want to meet people again. I want to live the life of a 23 year old or mm -hmm. going on 24. Yeah. So I went back into work then and um, as a flight attendant for about a year and a half and I did transatlantic and I was still on tamoxifen I was still on Zolidex I used to, I remember I spent like I used to have to if my Zolidex you'd have to give it every 28 days and if it fell on a day that I was ab abroad like I used to just throw it into my suitcase and bring it off me and give myself the Zolidex <laughs> injection while I was in like the US or Norway or wherever I was at the time Gosh. so yeah and then and at any topic. point did they did your team talk to you about fertility and how would like did they talk about freezing eggs or mm. was your cancer which I think it was so aggressive mm. that really there wasn't time for that you had to they start just, chemo straight away yeah there just wasn't time for it they spoke about like um making an embryo but like I was 22 and I remember just looking yeah. at them and looking at my mom and I was like I'm not with anybody long term that I could think yeah I want to have a baby with them I'm like I'm yeah. 22 so they said that but then I couldn't freeze my eggs because from the time I was diagnosed the time my first chemo it was two weeks so there was no time to freeze eggs yeah. there just wasn't that time um wow. so still to this day I don't know and we don't know yeah. until I, if I want to go get fertility testing or like mm -hmm. I'm still on. So I just came off my Zolidex there about six months ago. My oncologist took me off it after five years um, and I'm still on Tamoxifen and I could be on that for another five years. Yeah. We just don't know. It just yeah. depends on what my Definitely oncologist Definitely the research says. has shown in the last two years at least. Mm -hmm. Well, while they used to say Tamoxifen was fine five years and you can come off, mm. they're now saying 10 years yeah. is much And because better. I'm that younger, Young. mm. they want to like obviously give me the best possible chance. Yeah. So yeah. Wow. And you found love. I did. Lockdown love. Wow. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. So I got with my fiance um just at the start of lockdown. We met when I moved home to Clifton after losing my job due to COVID. And he was working on on the oil rig. So he had come home from the US. And yeah, and um, we we got together and we moved in a couple of months later. We both went back up to Dublin when COVID was kind of coming back to or leaving us. We were coming back to yeah. normality. We both moved up to Dublin and then we got engaged. Um, and now we just bought a house. We've got two dogs and two cats oh, and the whole that lot. So great man, though. Yeah. Yeah. He took and I it suppose all on. as a young woman, yeah. having been through the mill, mm -hmm. having that conversation with a new partner must be difficult. Yeah, it is because he would have been he would have been the only serious relationship let's say that I would have had posted uh -huh. so to have that conversation with somebody and not know what way they're going to take it is quite hard when you really really love somebody and mm -hmm. um, I would have been quite honest from the very start because what's the point wasting anybody's time if somebody yeah. doesn't want that they don't want it and I think 
physically as well, I would look different because of my reconstruction surgeries. So that's another thing that kind of will would play into it too. So like having a new relationship and having a new partner and not knowing if I can have kids or what my fertility is. Like you have to have these conversations from the start sure. because what's the point in going the mill and then mm-hmm. figuring out that mm-hmm. I couldn't have kids or I can't and then they might want it. But he took it all on the chin. He, he wow. yeah, he's, he's amazing. He took it all on the chin. Yeah. Yeah. And it was interesting. I remember you saying, you know, there you were, this young, vibrant 22 year old living life, you know, uh, having great fun at the weekends, like every 22 yeah. year old, you know, getting yourself back into work on a yeah. Monday and then having to leave that kind of 22 year old life of party and fun and move back home. Yeah. So I moved home with my mom, my stepdad, and that was a big adjustment. But I'm sure it was a big adjustment for them as well, because yeah. they would have shipped me off and yeah. they were living their <laughs> life. And then I just landed back with my bag. So. Yeah. But my mom was amazing. My mom was, she, I just, there's no words I can describe how good my mom was to me when mm. I went through this. She she brought me through everything. I wouldn't have done it without her, yeah. hands down. Yeah. She was there at every appointment, every chemo. She drove me up and down from Cavan. Every radiotherapy I went through, everything. My mom mm-hmm. was there by my side for it all. So yeah. in that sense, it was lovely. Um, and my brother as well with my niece and his wife, they were very good to me as well. I think family is massive for this. Like mm. you really need the support because you're already going through it. So having that outlet of of family around you kind of brings you away from like, oh, you know, you're just you're going through chemo and you have this really hard life. And it's it is. But at the same time, having the outlet of having really great friends and family around you really bring you from it because as awful as it is, mm. it's like mine was obviously treatable which was great Mm -hmm. and I took it by the balls and I just went with it and I I did Mm -hmm. what I had to do but it was from the strength that my friends my family gave me that Mm -hmm. really brought me through it because Mm -hmm. I have a really great family support Mm -hmm. and that's definitely what you need and my brother from Toronto came home he surprised me one one day and he came home and he like rocked into the house I remember my mom and I were like oh my god yeah (laughs) but it was great and then my brother from London and like it's it was it was nice Mm -hmm. um but it it is it is that impact while it does impact the person themselves you know physically obviously and mentally but it is that support yeah. crew. Everybody is impacted yes. by the by the. Di- it's not diagnosis. just the person not who's going person. through it. I yeah. think it's actually even harder for the people who are supporting you through it because mm. they're the ones that are trying to keep the brave face. They're the ones who are trying to pick up all the pieces and and make it seem like everything is going to be okay. So, mm. like my mom would have taken the brunt of it all. She would have been the one smiling and and you know like getting me through it and looking after me and like mm-hmm. putting her life on hold to to a point because she then started looking after her twenty two year old daughter. Yeah. So like she would have put her life on hold and mm-hmm. so would my stepdad of yeah. to help me yeah and to make sure that I was okay mm-hmm. and that's that's hard yeah, like. very very difficult and tell me did you venture down the road of Dr. Google <clears throat> no actually I didn't well <laughs> I think it was because I just didn't like you know I just didn't think about it yeah I think I was the information like, you were being given obviously was enough for you yeah, to just accept I think my mom on. probably did my no my mom definitely did <laughs> <laughs> but I just didn't I think I was just no, I'm not going to say content, but I think I was like happy, as you said, with the information that I'd been given. Mm. And I was just like, but I'd say my mom was definitely a secret Googler. Yeah. She yeah. still is. And what about your friend network? Were they surprised? I mean, 22 years of age is young. Very. Very young. I mean, yeah. look, statistically, um, women under the age of fi- between 20 and 50, we have 23% of women yeah. are diagnosed, which is yeah. staggering statistic. Yeah. That's, you know, yeah. and you are one of those. I am one of those. You know, yeah. but how did your friends... They were um, all as shocked as me. I think mm. we were all just, we were like... What? I think it took a while for everyone to get their head around it. Um, and I remember I wrote a blog after being diagnosed. Um, and I wrote a couple of them because I think it was kind of like, again, like an outlet for me to maybe express my feelings mm-hmm. that that I had because you've so many feelings. You've so many like things going on and you're like, you know, like I was a very positive person throughout it. Mm-hmm. I still am a very positive person. I think it's something that I was dealt with. And to a sense, I'm glad that say it was me that I was so positive through it. Mm-hmm. And I think that positivity brought me on that journey of being like, because I was so positive throughout it, I didn't feel maybe as sick or I didn't, you know, I didn't get let myself get down in the dumps about it. I just thought like, you know what, shit happens and yeah. this has happened to me mm-hmm. and let's just move on with it. And where do I go next? Mm-hmm. What's my next point? Um, but it would have been, yeah, like I wrote a blog about it and I remember like people commenting being like, 
like that's crazy like you're mm. so young like yeah I like I can't believe that like you're only 22 and I think it's a, it's a massive shock and everybody who I met across the board when I was in the hospital after I'd been diagnosed they were like you're 22 and I'm like yeah yeah because yeah. it must have been daunting sitting in James's in the waiting room and looking around oh, and seeing the age yeah. profiles of others. Yeah, even and now. they're probably looking at you going with your mom thinking, oh, you're oh, here with your, your mom. mom. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's even now. Like, so I, was, I see my oncologist every six months um, and I'll still go see him in his rooms and I will sit there and there'll just be women who are like between like 50 to 80. And mm-hmm. I am always and always have been the youngest person yeah. in that waiting room. Yeah. And I remember being in uh, James's after my surgery and it's a very, it's like a training uh, hospital. Yes. They have a lot of people come in like registrars and so on. Mm. And I remember sitting there and like a couple of guys came in after I'd done my surgery and like they were like, oh, do you mind if the, the, the guys here like stay while we do your examination and like I had been so used at this point of people looking at my boobs and I was like yeah no problem (laughs) and it would have been guys my age yeah do you know what I mean and they're all young doctors and I would have been like yeah it's fine and like they like they'll obviously like check it out and look at it and they feel it just to make sure that everything is obviously okay and there's no infections and so on but I remember thinking like I was like oh my god they're my age and I'm here lying in a bed Mm -hmm. like after having a mastectomy and we're the same age I know and they're probably astounded by that yeah that is like do you know what mm. I mean and I'm like that's crazy to think yeah um but I just didn't have any shame I was like yeah it's fine I know well uh, especially you're having so been used through, to it yeah, when you've you're, been through yeah. so much at that point it's yeah. like you're so you know, used to it yeah there's no be- difference in it now at that yeah. point like so yeah and when you finally finished your treatment and you finally finished your surgeries um you get to the point and I've often spoken to people about this where you are deemed fit and well again mm-hmm. and you suddenly so is that when you kind of think to yourself, holy mother, I have yeah. just been through on this roller coaster. I think that's when the 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 the, the mind will start playing. I think that's when that side of it comes in because you go on this road of, OK, well, it's chemo this week and then next week it's surgery. And then you're on such a, like because it was so quick quick for me that it was such a quick moving and then that 14 months was up really quickly and then I sat and I thought oh my god like I have no hair I've no eyelashes I've no eyebrows I've no <laughs> nothing and I'm like 23 and I'm like I that's that's when the thoughts that's when you start thinking um and I think that's when the mental health comes into it um I would never have suffered with, with mental health it wouldn't like I uh, like I said very positive first and yeah. heard the whole thing and then that was when I got to the point where I was like okay well I'm not sick anymore because you know my chemo's done and my surgery's done and this is done and that's done so now it's time for me to get back into the world but I think maybe had I have let it consume me and consume who I was as a person I think that's when stuff could have started happening Mm -hmm. but because I just said like you know I'm still circa I'm not oh the girl with cancer Mm -hmm. like I was still me and Mm -hmm. I was still doing what I wanted to do Mm -hmm. um and so you just packed your Zolodex and off you went off on your I long went, haul flights. Off I went my long haul flights <laughs> with my suitcase, like 20 kg overweight. <laughs> but yeah, I just oh. didn't let it consume me because I think mm. that's what you have to do. Mm. But that was my experience of it. Yeah. That's what and I needed to do. And I suppose it brings it all around to, you know, one of the things we as Breast Cancer Ireland are passionate about is that um, education and awareness piece, yeah. especially for younger women, because we find that, as we said earlier, breast check cater for the 50 yeah. plus people to go and have your free mammogram. But it's more a case of women understanding and men, because, you yeah, know, one in 1,000 men, men do, ha- do get breast cancer. It's about understanding the signs and symptoms that it is more than a lump. Yeah. You know, it can be that dimpling on the underside of the breast. Yeah. It can be one breast slightly larger than the yeah. other. You know, it can be a swelling in the lymph nodes, yeah. etc. It's it, like there are eight signs and symptoms. And we often say to people, you know, the most important thing is to, we say often, is to download our Breast Aware app. It's yeah. a free app. Yeah sends a monthly reminder to your phone, a little pink ribbon pops up and it just shows you a simulated video guide on how to do a proper self-exam and also what to look out for. The idea being that if you you spot it, if you're normal, if you start at a baseline of normal today, in a couple of months time, if anything changes and you're concerned, you go and contact your GP because early detection, it does save lives. It does. You know, and we're out. proven. You are. You are proof of, <laughs> yeah. you know, because we even we have a, a complimentary service that we provide to um, schools and yeah. we send out our education coordinators all around the country. And one of the things we've noticed is that the awareness sessions they might do, there's a five of five of them covering yeah. um, 
Munster, Ulster, uh, sorry, Munster, Connacht and Leinster. And what we find is that of the 35,000 women and young girls that they see every year, there are a couple of early detected cases yeah. as a result, which yeah. is, it is harrowing, but it's fantastic that yeah. we're catching them. Yeah. So that is really, really important. And I know it's Definitely. something that you feel passionate about. Definitely. Is that wim- younger women just yeah. need to take their breast health more seriously. Definitely. Because my friends would have been the same as me. Like they wouldn't have been breast aware. And then after my diagnosis, my friends were breast aware all the time. And I always say to them, I'm like, check your boobs. And like my friend, my best friend just had a baby and I'm always, I'm always like to her. Double check. Just make sure. Just yeah. do it every month for me. Just make yeah. sure. And she is very good. She does do it. Because she's just like, no, it's happened to you. And, you know, it can just happen to anybody. And that's my thing is that it's not, I think it's very much associated with an older generation thing. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's, it's proving time and time again that it's not. Yeah. And I just want people, young people, like people in middle age or like even health professionals to understand that when somebody comes to you with something like this to not dismiss them because if it weren't for my mom that day saying I want to see a consultant I would have gone because I would have said sure you're a health professional you know and you're saying to me come back in eight weeks and I would have come back in eight weeks yeah with a very different story a very very different story especially with that aggressive so yeah that's that's what I'm so passionate about is that I want everybody to know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that it's definitely not just somebody who's 50 plus that this happens Mm -hmm. to Mm -hmm. and it is something that it will continue to happen and there'll be people younger than me of course there will be and I'm sure there is people who Mm -hmm. were younger than me when I was diagnosed Mm -hmm. Um, but it's something that people need to be be aware of and as you say the medical profession the GP practices it's something that we took on about two or three years ago where we were sending our shower card yeah to oh, all yeah. the GP surgeries yeah. because we were hearing a lot of, of, of case studies saying, you know, but my GP thought, no, I'm too young. Yeah. So off you go on your merry way and I'll see you in two months yeah. time or three months time yeah. if you if it still persists. So yeah. oftentimes that can be, in your case, it yeah. would have been a very different diagnosis. Yeah, and I'm so glad that my GP as a woman was like, no, let's just send you. Yeah. Let's just send you as a precaution. Yeah. Let's make sure that we do this. Yeah. And that has to be something that has to be across the yeah. board. And it is, it is interesting because the GPs do triage you, which yeah. is, you know, are you medium risk, low risk, high risk? Yeah. And for even them saying to you that you were probably a low risk. Yeah. Um, but it was it was just it was the perseverance of your mom. Yeah. Again, that Again, day it was to insist. Yeah. Yeah. Because if it weren't for my mom, like I, I would have gone because yeah. I'm just like, it's, it's fine. Like They know. But mm. they know. And yeah. I, I, I can I can say that when that consultant came in and fell to my lump, he knew. Yeah. He knew yeah. because he deals with this day in, mm-hmm. day out, mm-hmm. 100 times a day. Yeah. yeah, He knew. And that's it. And I think, though, women and indeed men, you, once you know your body, yeah. you know, and if you know your body and you know your baseline, if you spot yeah. that abnormality, you know, you, you it's in, intuition as well. You just yeah. say, I got to have this in. Yeah, 100%. You know, and I do think women and we all need to be a little bit more forceful yeah. if we are concerned. You know, yeah. I really want to get to the to the end of this. Yeah. Thank you so much, Sirica, for traveling from Cavan today to, to chat to us. I know you're going to be an inspiration to so many young women. I am, I am fully confident that they will all be so much more breast aware having listened to this podcast. Thank you so much and I wish you the very best in the future. Thank you. The information in this podcast is based on the personal stories of those we have chatted to. If you are concerned in any way, please contact your GP immediately or you can contact us at breastcancerireland.com.